Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaskar students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are doing a course on Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita, the substantive law on crimes. Today, we will be discussing in session 17 of this course, topics pertaining to offenses affecting public health, safety, convenience, decency, and morals. So students, we all live in a civilized society. We all have certain rights, and at the same time, there cannot be any rights without corresponding duties. So we have to enjoy our rights in a way that they don't hinder the enjoyment of rights of other persons. And towards that end, we have to be mindful of our duties so that other persons might also enjoy their rights properly. And towards that end, what the law has done? It has declared certain acts to be crimes. Which acts? Those acts which are detrimental to the public health, those that hinder other person's safety, those that disturb the convenience, decency and morals of the public. So what are those offences? In this session, we will be talking about those offences in detail. To begin with, first of all, we will talk about public nuisance. Nuisance, that is something disturbance, something that we don't like, that's something that has the capacity to disturb people. So a person is guilty of a public nuisance who does any act or is guilty of an illegal omission which causes any common injury, danger or annoyance to the public or, the, or to the people in general who dwell or occupy property in the vicinity or which must necessarily cause injury, obstruction, danger or annoyance to persons who may have occasion to use any public right, but a common nuisance is not excused on the ground that it causes some convenience or advantage. See, you do something which is to your convenience. That is convenient to some of your friends also, but that is causing inconvenience to a large majority of people. So that is something which would amount to public nuisance. See, nuisance is a civil wrong, but when there is a public dimension of such civil wrong, it amounts to a public wrong and at that time when it is causing harm or disturbance to a large number of people, then that is where the criminal law also comes in and that is where it has to be stopped and the one who does that is to be penalized under law. Now, section 271, it talks about negligent act likely to spread infection of disease dangerous to life. So, whoever unlawfully or negligently. So, what is the requirement here? The act should be done either in an unlawful manner. That is when you do something that you should not be doing or when you don't do something that you should be doing or negligently. With that is when you omit to exercise the due care or precaution that you should have exercised in the given circumstances. So, whoever unlawfully or negligently does any act which is, now here again students, act includes omission. That is when you do something that you are not supposed to do or when you omit to do something that you are supposed to do. So, act includes omission. So, whoever unlawfully or negligently does any act which is and which he knows or has reason to believe to be, okay? likely to spread the infection of any disease and what kind of disease? Disease dangerous to life shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine or with both. 
So, you have to be careful so as not to spread infections of diseases that could be dangerous to life. You might be suffering, you know that someone else is suffering. So, you have to take precautions that no one else is transmitted that disease. If it can be transmitted through negligence on your part, you have to be careful in that direction. That is a legal obligation that a law puts on you. And if you fulfill, uh, you fail to fulfill your duty, it could be punishable under this provision. Then, section 272 talks about malignant act that is likely to spread infection of disease dangerous to life. So, whoever malignantly, see when we talk about malignantly, there is a high degree of virulence and it also talks about some sort of malice that is included in that. So, whoever malignantly does any act which is and which he knows or has reason to believe, either you have the knowledge or you have reasons to believe it is to be likely to spread the infection of any disease dangerous to life shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to two years or with fine or with both. See students section 271, 272 they were always there in the earlier penal law also such acts which uh, have the capacity of spreading infections or diseases that are dangerous to life they were always there in the law. But in contemporary times, they have assumed even more significance since the world is yet emerging from the aftermaths of COVID, which was a highly contagious disease. So it was something which was spreading at large. So that was the time when the state had imposed lots of restrictions and those restrictions, they were in addition to these provisions, which even otherwise impose in legal obligations on persons who have the capacity to stop or control or check the spread of infection. So, there is a legal duty on such persons to do that. Then section 273 penalizes disobedience to quarantine rule. Whoever knowingly disobeys any rule made by the government for putting any mode of transport into a state of quarantine or for regulating the intercourse of any such transport in a state of quarantine or for regulating the intercourse between places where an infectious disease prevails and other places shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine or with both. See here, it is not about knowingly disobeying any rule. It doesn't mean that ignorance of law would be an excuse. What it says is, if despite having the knowledge you do something, even if you were not aware of such a rule of quarantine being in place, because see, once a rule has been imposed, it is something that everybody has naturally to know. Everybody is supposed to know. So one has to be vigilant because the law will not safeguard the rights of those who sleep over their rights and at the same time the law is not going to protect those who are not aware of what the law is. So, ignorance of law is never an excuse. You have to know, you have to be mindful of your surroundings, you have to be mindful of the laws, the rights that the law has given to you, the restrictions that the law has imposed upon you. See, if somebody violates a traffic rule, can the person be allowed to take a plea that, see, I was not aware that this is a traffic rule. You cannot be on the roads and not know the traffic rules. Similarly, you cannot be in a state where a lot of infectious diseases are there and you may not be aware of the quarantine rule. So, you have to know that and if you knowingly violate, here knowledge is not knowledge of the law. Here knowledge is were you aware that you are suffering from a medical condition or that this kind of an act is something which is going to spread the infection. So, if you do that and if there is a quarantine rule there, it would be penalized under the law. Then section 274 talks about adulteration of food or drink intended for sale. So, what 274 says is, whoever adulterates any article of food or drink, so as to make such article noxious, that is poisonous, as food or drink, intending to sell such article as food or drink, or knowing it to be likely that the same will be sold as food or drink. So, here what is punishable is adulteration. An adulteration should be done so as to make such article harmful to be consumed either as food or as a drink. And then if you have intended to sell such 
article or you did not intend to sell it yourselves but you knew that it will be sold as food or drink and despite that you have done that action then punishment is a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine or 5000 rupees or with both. Sale of noxious food or drink. See here you have not adulterated that but you are merely selling it. So that is also a punishable crime. Whoever sells or offers or exposes for sale as food or drink any article which has been rendered or has become noxious or is in a state unfit for food or drink knowing or having reason to believe that the same is noxious as food or drink shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. See you cannot be selling stale cut fruit and say that I was not aware that it has become unfit for human consumption. Now that is something which every person is supposed to know. That see if there is a stale food item that is being sold, if the food was not stored as per the requirements mentioned on the, cap it, uh, on the packet or as per the other requirements which a person knows that see if you have prepared fresh food it has to be stored in a particular way. If you do not adhere to those instructions, if you do not follow what every reasonable person is supposed to know and follow then that is something which would be punishable under this law because what it says is knowing or having reason to believe that the same is noxious as food or drink and despite that if you are selling it for a petty profit the law penalizes such kind of acts. Then adulteration of drugs, see this is a very very serious offence, why does a person require drugs or medicines because the person is already, already suffering from some, kind of a, uh, some type of an illness or an ailment and at that time if you are selling adulterated drugs, okay, medicines which a person turns to in order to cure himself but what is happening either the medicine is not effective or the medicine has some counter effect, in both cases it is a crime. So what does the law say? Whoever adulterates any drug or medical preparation in such a manner as to lessen the efficacy or change the operation of such drug or medical preparation or to make it noxious intending that it shall be sold or knowing that it is likely that it will be sold or used for any medicinal purpose as if it had not undergone gone such adulteration shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to one year or with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. So in this provision what is a punishable crime? Adulteration of the drug and you have adulterated the drug in a way that it has been either rendered less effective or it has changed the operation okay or it has been rendered noxious. And you have done that either with the intention that it has to be sold, you have done it in order to make huge profits or even if you did not have the intention to sell but you knew that after doing that it will be still sold and it will not perform the medicinal purpose that it was supposed to do. If it had not undergone such kind of an adulteration then the punishment is imprisonment up to one year. And whosoever sales, sells those adulterated drugs, it is also punishable under the law. What does section 277 say? Whoever knowing any drug or medical preparation to have been adulterated in such a manner as to lessen its efficacy, to change its operation or to render it noxious. So three things, the drug has been adulterated in a way that either it loses its efficacy or the efficacy is reduced, operation has changed or it has been rendered noxious. So whoever knowing that medicine to have been adulterated sells the same or offers or exposes it for sale or issues it from any dispensary for medicinal purposes as unadulterated or causes it to be used for medicinal purposes by any person not knowing of the adulteration shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine which may extend up to 5000 rupees or with both. Then sale of drug as a different drug or preparation. Section 278 says whoever knowingly sells or offers or exposes for sale 
So what is punishable is selling such a drug knowingly. Even if you are offering or exposing it for sale or if you are issuing it from a dispensary for medicinal purposes. What is being sold? Any drug or medical preparation as a different drug or medical preparation. Then the punishment is imprisonment up to 6 months or with fine which may extend up to 5000 rupees or with both. Now fouling water of public spring or reservoir. Okay. Whoever voluntarily corrupts or fouls the water of any public spring or reservoir so as to render it less fit for the purpose for which it is ordinarily used shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. So students see section 279, section 280 these are imposing a duty on people to protect their environment to not make the environment unhealthy, to not pollute our surroundings, to not pollute water bodies or generally not to litter around. So section 279 imposes a penalty for fouling water of public reservoir or spring and section 280 talks about making atmosphere noxious, unsuitable, unfit for health. So whoever voluntarily vitiates the atmosphere in any place so as to make it noxious to the health of persons in general dwelling or carrying on business in the neighborhood or passing along a public way shall be punished with imprison uh, shall be punished with fine which may extend to 1000 rupees so if you are not taking care and you are doing activities due to which a lot of pollution is being created due to which people living nearby or even on a public way they are facing some sort of environmental concerns hazards health hazards in traversing that area or in living in that area their health is being affected so that is what is punishable under this provision then rash driving or riding on a public way See, we already discussed a provision relating to causing death by a rash and negligent act which also includes rash and negligent driving deaths that are caused. But suppose no death has been caused, not even any harm has been caused but still your act in itself was rash. See students, there is a difference between rashness and negligence. Rashness is a higher degree of negligence. See, when any person does any activity, even the most basic of activities, there is a minimum degree of care and precaution that everybody is supposed to exercise. See, while you are climbing down the stairs, you are supposed to be watchful of where you place your foot. Otherwise, you can stumble your fall. So that is a basic degree of care and precaution that you should exercise. If you are negligently rushing down the stairs, if you miss a step, you can stumble, you can fall, you can fall upon someone else, you can accelerate the other person's fall also. So there could be so many consequences if you are not careful in things that you are doing. What happens? That is negligence when you fail to exercise the due degree of care and diligence that every reasonable person is expected to exercise. When your negligence is of a higher degree, when you are mentally indifferent to a risk which is obvious, okay? when you are overconfident, when you feel that no everything is under control while actually is not under control, you are hoping against hope that no nothing is going to go wrong and I am absolutely in control of the situation whereas there is every, always a possibility that something might go wrong. So if you have thrown all caution to the winds just on the basis of that overconfident state of mind of yours that is what is known as a rash act. So a higher degree of negligence when you know that dangerous consequences may ensue because this is something which is inherently dangerous or careless that I am doing but still you are hoping against hope that no nothing is going to go wrong because I am in control of the situation. Okay. So that would be a higher degree of negligence that amounts to rashness. So what 281 penalizes is rash driving or riding on a public way. Here especially see there are two things. There has to be rashness and that rashness has to be on a public way not a private area. So whoever drives any vehicle or rides on any public way in a manner so rash or negligent as to endanger human life. See here we are talking about driving any vehicle or riding on any public way. 
See, when we talk about vehicles, when we talk about motor vehicles, they are meant to be driven at speed and they are designed and they are manufactured in such a way. But then again, subject to the conditions of the road, subject to the people that are moving around, there are restrictions that are imposed. There are speed limits imposed. Whether the road has potholes, whether it is a single lane, whether it is a double lane, whether it is two-way, whether it is barricaded on the sides, whether it, there is a proper lighting on that area, there are so many things, whether it's an internal colony road, whether it is a public highway. Now, what is the status of that place where that road is? So, depending on that, speed limits, they are fixed by the state to safeguard the health and safety of its people. And then again, see what might be laid down is a maximum speed limit. That doesn't mean that you are supposed to drive on that speed. Okay. If there is a lot of traffic on that road, despite having that fixed limit at say 80, there is a possibility you might not be able to drive even at 40. In that circumstances to argue that see it is a permissible, 80 is permissible and I was driving only at 70. But look at the conditions surrounding you. In such circumstances, even though you were driving below the prescribed speed limit, but given the circumstances, your act might be rash. So it is very, very subjective. So what the law lays down here is, whoever drives any vehicle or rides on any public way in a manner so rash or negligent, so as to endanger human life. It is not necessary that somebody gets killed, but your act in itself is so dangerous that it has endangered human life or be likely to cause hurt or injury to any other person, not to you, but to any other person, shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine which may extend to 1000 rupees or with both. So you see, even if your rash act has not resulted in harm to anyone, but it has the capacity to have, could have, it could have resulted in a harm. So what the law seeks to do is prevent the commission of offences. See, the law does act once the offence has been committed, but it is also a duty of law to prevent the commission of offences in the first place, and this is a provision in that direction. Now coming to section 282 that talks about rash navigation of vessel. Here we are talking about ships, boats. So, whoever navigates any vessel in a manner so rash or negligent as to endanger human life or to be likely to cause hurt or injury to any other person shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine which may extend to 10,000 rupees or with both. So you see rash driving, rash navigation of vessels, whether it is on the roads, whether it is in the rivers, on the seas, any place. Rashness, where you are behind the wheels, where you are responsible for navigating or driving a vehicle, you are supposed to be mindful of your surroundings and you are to be mindful of the safety of others who might be harmed by your rash actions. Then, section 283 talks about exhibition of false light, mark or boy. Whoever exhibits any fa false light, mark or boy, intending or knowing it to be likely that such exhibition will mislead any navigator. Okay, you are looking at a light. It is supposed to be a tower in the middle of the sea. But that is a false light that is being exhibited by someone to mislead any navigator. So that in itself is a crime and which shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 7 years and with fine which shall not be less than 10,000 rupees. Conveying person by water for hire in unsafe or overloaded vessel. Now this is section 84. Now see there are activities of trafficking also that are taking place through the seas. People they are trying to unlawfully migrate also. People they are trying to, sometimes it's not a case of migration. Within the country itself people they endanger their own life as well as the lives of others when they board vehi uh, vehicles or vessels which are already overloaded beyond their capacity. So if you are conveying by water such a person for hire in unsafe on unloaded or overloaded vessel that in itself is a punishable crime. What does the law say? Whoever knowingly or negligently conveys or causes to be conveyed for hire any person by water in any vessel 
when the vessel is in such a state or so loaded as to endanger the life of that person. Okay, you are aware that the vessel is already in such a state that it cannot carry any more load and still you are carrying a person. So, that act would be punishable with the imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. So, here what the law says is it is not that you intend to harm that person, but you are being negligent when despite knowing that see there is a load carrying capacity of a vessel you are exceeding that load and you know that it could be dangerous but still you are hoping that no nothing is going to go wrong maybe I am in control of the situation. So, that kind of overconfidence, that kind of negligence is something which the law aims to curb or check. Section 285, danger or obstruction in public way or line of navigation. So, whoever by doing any act or by omitting to take order with any property in his possession or under his charge causes danger, obstruction or injury to any person in any public way or public line of navigation shall be punished with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees. Then 286 talks about negligent conduct with respect to poisonous substances. So, whoever does with any poisonous substance, any act in a manner so rash or negligent as to endanger human life or to be likely to cause hurt or injury to any person or knowingly or negligently omits to take such order with any poisonous substance in his possession as is sufficient to guard against any probable danger to human life from such poisonous substance shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. So, when we are talking about poisonous substances, it could be poisonous animals, it could be a snake, it could be a scorpion, it could be other poisonous substances such as poison or some other kind of that substance which is detrimental for human consumption. So, you are supposed to keep such substances away from reach of ordinary people so that nobody can mistake it for something else. You should properly label it, you should carefully uh, put it at a place which is beyond the reach of people who are not aware of the nature of that poisonous substance. If your act is negligent in respect of handling of those poisonous substances, if you are keeping any poisonous substance, any poisonous animal with you, there is a minimum degree of care and precaution that you are supposed to exercise. And if your actions are found to be lacking in respect of that due degree of care and precaution, it would be punishable under section 286 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. Negligent conduct with respect to fire or combustible matter. What section 287 says? Whoever does with fire or any combustible matter any act so rashly or negligently as to endanger human life. See, you've got combustible matter, you've got uh, large quantities of say diesel, petrol or kerosene with you and you are not exercising due care or precautions or maybe you've got lots of firecrackers and you've stored it at a place where you know that maybe some welding work is going on nearby. Maybe there could be a spark from any electrical wiring or anything which can set off a chain of explosions and if you have not exercised due precaution in respect of preservation or keeping of those substances that you have with you, so that would be punishable under this law. What it says, whoever does with fire or any combustible matter any act so rashly or negligently as to endanger human life or to be likely to cause hurt or injury to any other person or knowingly or negligently omits to take such order with any fire or any combustible matter in his possession as is sufficient to guard against any probable danger to home, human life from such fire or combustible matter shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine which may extend to 2000 rupees or with both. Then section 288 deals with negligent conduct with respect to explosive substance. So, whoever does 
with any explosive substance any act so rashly or negligently as to endanger human life or to be likely to cause hurt or injury to any other person. See, it is not that you have deliberately caused injury to any person by means of that explosive. That would be a separate offense. Here, if you have certain explosive substance in your custody and you have not exercised the due care and precaution that you were supposed to exercise as one who was in charge of that substance. So that is punishable. So whoever does with any explosive substance any act so rashly or negligently as to endanger human life or to be likely to cause hurt or injury to any other person or knowingly or negligently omits to take such order with any explosive substance in his possession as is sufficient to guard against any probable danger to human life from that substance shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. So you see anyone who has in his custody any poisonous substance, any combustible matters, any explosive substances. So you have to exercise an extra degree of care and precaution which a person who is placed in charge or one who has possession of these things is supposed to exercise in respect of these substances given the especially dangerous nature, dangerous character of these substances. Then negligent conduct with respect to machinery. Under section 289, whoever does with any machinery, any act so rashly or negligently as to endanger human life or to be likely to cause hurt or injury to any other person or knowingly or negligently omits to take such order with any machinery in his possession or under his care as is sufficient to guard against any probable danger to human life from such machinery shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. Similarly, negligent conduct with respect to pulling down, repairing or constructing buildings etc. See you might be a builder, a contractor, you are in uh, charge of constructing buildings, demolishing buildings. So what is to be taken care of? That while constructing, while demolishing, while bringing any building down, what are the possible perils that people around can be exposed to? And you have to be mindful of all that. You have to take care that nobody is harmed in the process of your work. So for that, Section 290 imposes an obligation on you to take due care and precaution. And if you don't do that, that would amount to a negligent conduct under Section 290, which is punishable as per the law. So what does the law say? Whoever in pulling down, repairing, or constructing any building knowingly or negligently omits to take such measures with that building as is sufficient to guard against any probable danger to human life from the fall of that building or of any part thereof shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine or may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. See you I might be constructing a building for that you have uh, did a lot of digging work that has been done. Due to digging what happens the soil shifts and the building adjacent to your building that is under construction that falls. Now that would be covered under section 290 and it could be a higher offense also in case somebody within that building gets injured or gets killed. Then similarly you must have seen at building sites and all they are now properly barricaded. There are now markers. Why? Because now as more and more people have become vigilant about the laws, about the building laws, about the regulations. So now people they are exercising due care and precaution that is required to be exercised while undertaking tasks of that magnitude because nowadays high rises are being constructed everywhere. So that demands even a higher degree of precaution that has to be exercised. And if your act is found to be lacking in respect of the due precautions that you were supposed to exercise while undertaking an action of an activity of that magnitude, that would be penalized under 290. Then is section 291. 
negligent conduct with respect to animal. So, whoever knowingly or negligently omits to take such measures with any animal in his possession as is sufficient to guard against any probable danger to human life or any probable danger of grievous hurt from such animal shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees or with both. So, if you have an animal in your custody in your position and if that animal is known to have a dangerous proposition then in such cases you are supposed to exercise certain safeguards. Say if you have a pet dog and you take the dog out for a walk. So, now you are aware of the nature of your pet animal. If that pet animal bites someone, the pet animal cannot be punished. Who is to be punished? The human being who was in charge, who had the possession over that animal. So, why would you be punishable? Because you did not take the due precautions. You should have kept the dog on a leash. You should have maybe, if it was prone to biting, maybe you could have used a muzzle. Maybe you could have kept the animal at a appropriate distance from other people. So, all those precautions they have to be taken, but if you have taken due precautions and after that if there is any accident, then that is something which is not penalized under the law. What law penalizes is negligent conduct. That is a due degree of care and precaution that is expected of any reasonable person. So, for pet lovers, pet owners, there is a degree of care and precaution that everybody is expected to exercise. Then section 292, whoever commits a public nuisance in any case not otherwise punishable by the Sahita shall be punished with fine which may extend to 1000 rupees. And then 293, whoever repeats or continues a public nuisance having been enjoined by any public servant who has lawful authority to issue such injunction not to repeat or continue such nuisance. You are running any building if from a housing society in the middle of the housing society which is creating a lot of pollution, lot of dust is emanating from that. The public authorities they come with an injunction, they ask you to restrain your activities or put a stop on your activities despite that you continue such nuisance. Now something which has assumed public nuisance despite having an injunction you still do not relent then that is something which is punishable under section 293 with simple imprisonment for a term which may extend to 6 months or with fine which may extend up to 5000 rupees and it might be both imprisonment as well as fine. Now section 294 talks about the crime of obscenity. Now what amounts to obscenity is again a very very subjective term depending upon the uh, morality of individuals and morality as we all know it is a very diffuse concept. So, what one person finds obscene, the other one might not find obscene and this is especially true when we talk about works of art. In the same work of art, one might see obscenity, the other one might see some art. So, what is obscenity? That is again something very subjective depending upon the facts and circumstances of each and every case. But then there are certain objects which prima facie on the face of it anyone can say that this is obscene content, this is obscene material. So, what the law penalizes is sale or display of all such obscene matters. What does section 294 say? For the purposes of subsection 2, subsection 2 of this provision itself, a book, pamphlet, paper, writing, drawing, painting, representation, figure or any other object including display of any content in electronic form shall be deemed to be obscene if it is lascivious or appeals to the prurient interest or if its effect or where it comprises two or more distinct items the effect of any one of its item is if taken as a whole such as to tend to deprave and corrupt persons who are likely having regard to all relevant circumstances to read, see or hear the matter contained or embodied in it. So, something that appeals to the more baser instincts, that is something what is deemed as an obscene content. <coughs> Under subsection 2, <coughs> whoever sells, lets to hire, distributes, 
publicly exhibits or in any manner puts into circulation for his purposes of sale, hire, distribution, public exhibition or circulation, makes, produces or has in his possession any obscene book, pamphlet, paper, drawing, painting, representation or figure or any other obscene object whatsoever in whatever manner. So, selling or hiring, distributing public exhibitions and all that of obscene matter is a punishable crime. Imports, exports or conveys any obscene object for any of the purposes aforesaid or knowing or having reason to believe that such object will be sold, led to hire, distributed or publicly exhibited or in any manner put into circulation or takes part in or receives profits from any business in the course of which he knows or has reason to believe that any such obscene objects are for any of the purposes aforesaid made, produced, purchased, kept, imported, exported, conveyed, publicly exhibited or in any manner put into circulation, advertises or makes known by any means whatsoever that any person is engaged or is ready to engage in any act which is an offence under this section or that any such obscene object can be procured from or through that person or offers or attempts to do any act which is an offence under this section shall be punished on first conviction with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 2 years and with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees and in the event of a second or subsequent conviction with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 5 years and also with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees. So, you see whether any action is obscene or not, I told you it is very subjective. It depends upon the contemporary moral standards, the contemporary community standards. See the community standards also they keep on changing from time to time. Slight public display of affection which was earlier frowned upon, now it is slightly being accepted by the Indian society but then again the display of affection there are limitations on that also. So, all that depends upon community standards. In Paris there might be a different level of acceptance, in India there might be a different level of uh, acceptance. So, those com contemporary community standards will determine whether any object is, uh, whether any action, object, any paper, anything whether that is obscene or whether that is not obscene. So, all very, very subjective depending upon the facts, depending upon the circumstances, depending upon the morality of the recipients of such objects or such uh, 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 viewing material or reading material and then of course, depending upon the community standards and that too in contemporary times. So, all that has a bearing on this. There are certain exceptions to this provision regarding obscenity. This section does not extend to any book, pamphlet, paper, writing, drawing, painting, representation or figure, the publication of which is proved to be justified as being for the public good on the ground that such book, pamphlet, paper writing, drawing, painting, representation or figure is in the interest of science, literature, art or learning or other objects of general concern. Second, which is kept or used bona fide for religious purposes. Third uh, and B, is any representation sculptured, engraved, painted or otherwise represented on or in any ancient monument within the meaning of the ancient monuments and archaeological sites and remains act or any temple or on any car used for the conveyance of idols or kept or used for any religious purposes. So, you see uh, carvings in ancient temples, you see sometimes sculptures and all. So, it depends on the way it is perceived, it is seen. So, these would be all covered within the exceptions because they are all art and they are something which 
have certain religious feelings associated with it. There's a large community, there's a large group of people who look at that in the light of their religious beliefs. There might be some people who might be finding that obscene, but then the works of art, they are to be exempted from that. Work of religious beliefs, they are to be kept aside. But of course, if there is anything which hurts the religious sentiments, then that would not be protected herein. Sale of obscene objects to child. Obscenity per se is also punishable and when such obscene objects they are to be sold to be to children who are more open and easily susceptible to such moral immoral influences. So therein what does the law say? Whoever sells, lets to hire, distributes, exhibits or circulates to any child any such obscene object as is referred to in section 294 or offers or attempts so to do shall be punished on first conviction with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years and with fine which may extend to 2000 rupees and in the event of a second or subsequent conviction with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 7 years and also with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees. Section 296 talks about obscene acts and songs. So whoever to the annoyance of others does any obscene act in any public place. See here what is important is the act should be obscene and where should it be done? in public place. Doing an obscene act in private, in your private space, that would not be punishable herein because crimes talk about public wrongs. Again, so whoever to the annoyance of others, it is also important that others should be annoyed by that. So whoever to the annoyance of others does any obscene act in any public place, sings, recites or utters any obscene song, ballet or words in or near any public place shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 3 months or with fine which may extend to 1000 rupees or with both. 297 talks about keeping of lottery office. So whoever keeps any office or place for the purpose of drawing any lottery not being a state lottery or a lottery authorized by the state government shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to six months or with fine or with both and whoever publishes any proposal to pay any f sum or to deliver any goods or to do or forbear from doing anything for the benefit of any person on any event or contingency relative or applicable to the drawing of any ticket, lot, number or figure in any such lottery shall be punished with fine which may extend to 5000 rupees. Students after this now let us talk about the offences of criminal intimidation, insult and annoyance. So in criminal intimidation whoever threatens another by any means with any injury to his person, reputation or property. So what is being threatened to harm here? Injury to person, injury to reputation or injury to property or to the person or reputation of anyone in whom that person is interested. So when you are being threatened either your property, person or reputation or someone else's person, property or reputation but that someone else is one in whom you are interested with intent to cause alarm to that person or to cause that person to do any act which he is not legally bound to do or to omit to do any act which that person is legally entitled to do as the means of avoiding the execution of such threat commits the offence of criminal intimidation. So somebody has threatened to do that and the objective of such threatening was to scare you, to alarm you and if that has happened that is what amounts to criminal intimidation. A threat to injure the reputation of any deceased person in whom the person threatened is interested is within this section. See even dead persons have a right to their reputation not being uh, harmed by anyone. 
And if there is any heir of theirs, any relative or anyone else who is related or anyone who else who is interested in that dead, dead person's reputation, and if somebody threatens that person that we are going to injure the reputation of the deceased person, even that would be covered here in illustration. A for the purpose of inducing B to resist from prosecuting a civil suit threatens to burn B's house. Here A is guilty of criminal intimidation. Why? Because what has he done? He has threatened to destroy the property of that person. And why has he done that? For the purpose of inducing B to resist from prosecuting a civil suit. So this is something that amounts to criminal intimidation because in criminal intimidation we are talking about threats to person, property and reputation. <coughs> Whoever commits the offence of criminal intimidation shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to two years or with fine or with both. Whoever commits the offence of criminal intimidation by threatening to cause death or grievous hurt or to cause the destruction of any property by fire or to cause an offence punishable with death or imprisonment for life or with imprisonment for a term which may extend to seven years or to impute unchastity to a woman shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to seven years or with fine or with both. So you see in cases where the threat is to cause death, the threat is to cause grievous hurt or the threat is to destroy any property not by any other means but by fire or to do an offence which is heavily punishable that is the punishment for that offence would be death or life imprisonment and also in cases where a person commits intimidation to impute unchastity for a woman because for women their reputation it is very important. So if somebody does that to impute unchastity to a woman this is punishable with imprisonment for a term which may extend up to 7 years. Whoever commits the offence of criminal intimidation by an anonymous communication. Now the one who has received the communication does not know who has sent that communication or who has communicated that to him. But still the communication has reached that person or having taken precaution to conceal the name or abode of the person from whom the threat comes. You do not want to disclose your identity, you do not want to disclose the place from where such threat or communication was sent. This shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to two years in addition to the punishment provided for the offence under subsection 1. Then intentional insult with intent to provoke breach of peace. So whoever intentionally insults in any manner and thereby gives provocation to any person intending or knowing it to be likely that such provocation will cause him to break the public peace or to commit any other offence shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to two years or with fine or with both. See here it is not necessarily that you have insulted any particular person. You might have insulted any person in whom that particular person is interested. You might have insulted any person whom that other person revers, holds in high regard. You might have insulted a public figure or someone whom a lot of people who is a high religious dignitary whom a lot of people have great regard to. So whoever has intentionally insulted in any manner and by that insult you have provoked any person knowing it to be likely. You have either done that deliberately that people will react if such a thing has been done or even if you did not do with that intention but you knew that the person is held in high esteem by so many people and if you do such an act that will cause people to uh, just throw all caution to winds, people will react to that kind of an insult being heaped or being leveled against someone whom they hold in high regard or high esteem. Then in such cases if cause it causes a person to break the public peace or commit any other offence then the punishment would be for two years imprisonment and also fine. What are statements conducing to public mischief? 
Section 353 says, whoever makes, publishes, or circulates any statement. So even if you have made any statement, you have published it in any form, or even if you have circulated any such statement, false information, rumor, or report, including through electronic means. See, now these are all new additions to the law because nowadays with advancements in technology, it is very easy to upload, download any sorts of information from uh, the internet and telecommunication services. So whoever makes, publishes, or circulates any statement, false information, rumor, or report through any electronic means with intent to cause or which is likely to cause any officer, soldier, sailor, or airman in the Army, Navy, or Air Force of India to mutiny or otherwise disregard or fail in his duty as such or with intent to cause or which is likely to cause fear or alarm to the public or to any section of the public where any person may be induced to commit an offense against the state or against public tranquility or with intent to incite or which is likely to incite any class or community of persons to commit any offense against any other class or community shall be punished with imprisonment which may extend to three years or with fine or with both. And whoever makes, publishes or circulates any statement or report containing false information, rumor or alarming news, including through electronic means with intent to create or promote or which is likely to create or promote on grounds of religion, race, place of birth, residence, language, caste or community or any other ground whatsoever, feelings of enmity, hatred or ill will between different religious, racial, language or regional groups of castes or communities shall be punished with imprisonment which may extend to three years or with fine or with both. So this is something which is taking care of hate speeches. Then whoever commits an offense specified in subsection 2 in any place of worship or in any assembly engaged in the performance of religious worship or religious ceremonies shall be punished with imprisonment which may extend to five years and shall also be liable to fine. But there is an exception appended to this section which says it does not amount to an offense within the meaning of this section when the person making, publishing or circulating any such statement, false information, rumor or report has reasonable grounds for believing that such statement, false information, rumor or report is true and makes, publishes or circulates it in good faith without any such intent as aforesaid. So what is protected is a bona fide belief in the truth of the information that the person is circulating, then that would be something which would safeguard him from criminal prosecution. So students, that will be all for this session. In the upcoming session, we will be discussing offenses against property. Thank you.